Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by Tickbell and CME Group. We're going to begin in just a minute, uh, leading off with my colleague, Eric Norlin. Uh, he's going to join us here in just a second. And uh, he will begin uh, today's webinar. And I will follow up in the second half with a few uh, educational pointers, uh, a little bit more specific to the to the options business. Welcome back, Eric. Ready, ready to begin? Yes, indeed. I am almost ready to begin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just give me one second. I just, you know, interest rates have been moving so quickly. I was literally just updating a graph on my presentation right now so that it would still be relevant. Um, so yes, here we go. Um, so let's begin with the economics discussion. Uh, there is a tremendous amount going on. Um, to kind of bring this to light, I'm going to share a slide deck with you. Uh, just give me one second here. Um, okay, I think that this is it. Yes, here we go. Now let me share this. And uh, David, are you seeing this okay? I'm gonna put it in slideshow mode. I certainly am, full screen. Okay, yeah. One Thank second, you. there we go, slideshow mode. Thank you. Yeah, so tremendous amount happening that is impacting um, you know, commodity markets as well as financial markets. And the two markets, as we'll discuss, are very, very deeply interconnected. Um, the last time that David and I spoke with you um, in February, uh, we focused mainly on financial markets. Um, and so the topic this time is commodities and inflation. Uh, well, inflation, unfortunately, is still very much with us. Um, a few hours ago, um, at uh, 1 30 in the or 12 30 actually in the afternoon london time or 1 30 p.m on the continent we got the u.s cpi number the consumer price inflation number and that number came out uh, pretty close to consensus but it still showed six percent headline inflation and five and a half percent core inflation um, including a one half percent increase in core prices in the united states uh, just for the month of february alone um, and we also got European inflation out um, uh, earlier this month. Europe releases its inflation numbers very quickly. They came out, um, I think, on the 1st or 2nd of March, and it showed that core inflation in the euro area rose to 5.6%, its fastest pace uh, since Eurostat began collecting continent-wide or currency-wide data for the eurozone. Um, and so all of this is having a big impact on commodity markets, but it may not be the impact that you think. Uh, before we get into the heart of the presentation, I do have to show you uh, both the short version of our disclaimer, uh, which basically says that um, yeah, we are an exchange operator and cannot provide you with any financial advice. Uh, so no financial advice is given or intended. Um, and a longer disclaimer that explains how we are regulated um, in various markets, including uh, in various markets throughout um, the Euro area and throughout the European Union, um, and in its close neighbors like in, uh, in Dubai uh, and in the United Kingdom. Um, so with that in mind, um, we can begin with this topic of inflation. And I think most investors have this very simple model in their minds um, that inflation is good for commodities. So if inflation goes up, commodities should go up too. Um, but it turns out that reality is more complicated than that. Um, and inflation is not necessarily good for commodities. Uh, but I think that maybe the best place to begin this discussion is with gold, uh, because gold is often presented to investors as an inflation hedge. And it might be an inflation hedge, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but one thing that's very noticeable here is on the left-hand chart, um, we saw low and stable rates of inflation from 1998 until 2020, uh, typically around 2% inflation in the U.S., Europe, Europe the U.K. Um, and then suddenly we had this massive surge in, in, uh, in inflation, uh, you know, from 2% up towards, you know, 6 to 10%, depending on the country and which month you were looking at the, the data in. Um, you know, meanwhile, Gold hasn't really done what you might have expected. I mean, first of all, I don't show it in the chart, but gold prices back in 1998 were around $280 an ounce. Uh, by 2011, they had risen from $280 to $2,000 an ounce, or nearly $2,000 an ounce. Uh, so you had this huge run-up in gold prices, despite the fact of having had low and stable consumer price inflation. Um, you know, then 
you know, in the most recent period, gold prices uh, in the last two and a half years haven't done anything. You know, the gold price of gold uh, in the summer of 2020 uh, got to around $2,000 an ounce. And for the last two years and nine months, it's gone sideways, despite this huge, huge surge in inflation. Um, so I think a lot of investors are asking themselves, why did gold not hedge inflation? Um, you know, or did gold head inflation hedge inflation in a way that we maybe don't quite understand? Um, so it turns out the reality is more complicated. Um, you know, gold moves pretty independently of inflation, I think, for one simple reason, which is that gold is basically a currency, uh, but it's a currency that pays no interest. It's a zero interest currency. So if you own gold, you don't get any, you don't get any money for your gold deposit. Um, if by contrast, if you take your fiat currency, whether it's euros or pounds or dollars, and you put it in a bank, sometimes the bank will pay you interest. Um, in fact, usually banks pay interest on deposits. Uh, but it was really only in the period from 2008 to 2022, uh, when interest rates were set close to zero for most of that period, uh, that banks stopped paying interest on deposits. Um, so it turns out that gold has a very strongly negative correlation with expectations for interest rates in the future. Um, so in his left-hand charts, we have uh, the Fed funds future uh, uh, forward two years. So in other words, the interest rate market's view about where the Federal Reserve is most likely to have policy in two years' time um, in the black line, and then you have the price of gold in the blue line. Um, so what you can see is that there's somewhat of a negative relationship. When investors think the Federal Reserve is likely to begin raising rates in the next few years, the price of gold usually falls. Um, you know, that was the case for much of the period from 2014 to 2018, uh, when the market anticipated that the Fed was going to start raising rates, which it eventually did. Um, that wasn't very good news for gold. But then gold had this massive rally. Uh, but the massive rally didn't happen with inflation happening in 2021 and 2022 and 2023, the rally in gold happened from the beginning of 2019 to the middle of 2020. So why did that happen? Well, it happened because the Federal Reserve um, was expected to slash interest rates and indeed did slash interest rates. It cut interest rates from two and three eighths percent uh, down, to, uh, down to zero. Um, and this is the graph I was updating actually just a second ago. We say, no, we've had this huge, huge move in gold prices in the last few days. Um, and so, um, yeah, then the price of gold gets up to $2,000 an ounce, and then it doesn't go anywhere. So why? Well, on the one hand, inflation is pulling gold higher. You know, so the dollar, the euro, the pound, all of these fiat currencies issued by central banks are now losing value versus commodities. Um, so that's causing gold prices to stay up. But on the other hand, because of all the inflation, the market now expects the Federal Reserve and other central banks to begin tightening policy. Um, so there's policy expectations started to form a little bit in 2020 and uh, through um, the first half of 2021, but they really started accelerating in the second half of 2021 um, and into the middle of 2022. And you can see gold took a pretty big drop. It fell from $2,050 an ounce uh, down to around $1,600 an ounce. So it had a $400 drop in the price of gold despite high inflation. But over the last few months, markets have started to change their views of what the Fed is going to do. Um, and those views have been changing sometimes very rapidly. Um, last fall, for example, the market started saying, okay, the Fed can't really raise rates that much. So they're going to have to start cutting. Gold loved that. It rebounded from $1,600 to $1,900 an ounce. Um, then you know, we got some really strong numbers for employment growth and for inflation uh, in, in late January and in February. Uh, so the market started repricing. The Fed was going to maybe hike a bit more. What happened? Gold prices fell. Um, and then in the last couple of days, we had the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, which is the first real casualty of the Fed's interest rate hikes. Um, so in the last few days, we've seen a 100 basis point depricing of Fed rates. Uh, as a result of that, gold prices 
um, had some pretty nice days. They're up a couple percent on Friday, up 3% yesterday. Silver, which is a, sort of like a high beta version of gold, was up 6% yesterday. Uh, silver and gold are very highly correlated metals. Um, but on the right hand chart, you can see the one thing that is very consistent for silver and gold is that they have a negative correlation with changes in expectations of future Fed rates. Um, and so they really, really don't like higher rates. Um, but I think that what happened yesterday is very, very interesting uh, for gold and silver um, and for other commodities, as well as for interest rates and for equities, because it highlights the dilemma that central banks are in. You know, I'm based in London in the United Kingdom. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, the central bank here has raised interest rates up to 4%. Uh, but something here really strange happened last fall. Um, the uh, prime minister at the time, the very briefly serving Liz Trust, who lasted seven weeks in office, proposed massive supply side tax cuts. Um, as a result, the bond market started to sell off. So uh, the gilt market, the 10-year UK treasury bond rose from 3% to 5% yield. Um, and as they did that, it forced the central bank here into a dilemma. Either they could fight inflation by raising interest rates, or they could favor financial stability by intervening in the gilt market and printing 75 billion pounds to buy gilt. Um, the central bank here chose to intervene in favor of financial stability. Uh, we haven't seen something like that happen yet in the, in the euro area, uh, but in, over, in, over in Europe, the uh, European Central Bank is widely expected to raise interest rates 50 more basis points when they meet uh, two days from now, on Thursday this week. Despite all these rate hikes, these central banks have interest rates far, far below the level of inflation. You know, here in Europe, uh, we have interest rates roughly 220 basis points below the level of core inflation. Um, you know, and in the United States, it's a similar story. In the United States, the Federal Reserve, despite having done the biggest rate hike since 1981, raising interest rates 450 basis points and counting, it still has its policy rate over a percent below core inflation. Um, and so this, to my mind, is really, really shocking. And it really indicates that the Federal Reserve is also now in a dilemma. They can either continue to raise interest rates uh, to fight inflation, in which case they risk seeing more bank failures, like we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, more financial instability, or they can maybe stop raising interest rates to help the banking system adjust to uh, the higher rate environment, um, and then just maybe not fight inflation as hard and allow inflation to stay higher for longer. Um, so all central banks are now being faced with this choice between financial stability and fighting inflation. And this choice, I think, is very, very good for gold, uh, because no matter what the central bank chooses, it's likely to be good for gold. Um, if the central bank chooses financial stability, then in that case, um, that means they're going to stop raising rates. That could be positive for gold and for silver. Um, on the other hand, if they choose to keep raising rates, that might be bad for gold and silver in the short term, but it could cause more financial instability in the long term, which means at some point in the future, the Federal Reserve or the ECB might have to dramatically cut interest rates if we have a recession. Um, and that's basically what the financial markets are positioned for. Um, if you look at the yield curve in the U.S., short-term interest rates are now much, much higher than long-term interest rates. You have an inversion of the U.S. yield curve. Um, and the yield curve is a very good indicator of what, where the economy is going in perhaps 12 to 24 months' time. Um, so U.S. You know, people are saying, well, look, we've raised interest rates now and there's still no recession. You know, companies are still hiring, et cetera. That's true. But that's because there's a long lag between when the central bank moves policy and when it impacts the economy. Um, so all these Fed rate hikes, all the ECB rate hikes, et cetera, I think are going to show up in the economic data. Uh, sometime later this year and next year, we're going to see a big slowdown in Europe, um, a lot of financial instability in Europe, a lot of financial instability in the U.S. private sector, um, also really tough budget choices in Washington uh, with possible government shutdowns or defaults on debt, all of which damages the credibility of fiat currencies. 
Uh, the market for its part um, is pricing that the Federal Reserve will raise rates till maybe two more times, but then the market thinks the Fed's gonna start cutting rates, uh, probably later this year and through next year. Um, and so if that happens, that could be really, really good for gold. Um, so we've been talking a lot about gold. Gold is not the only commodity out there, of course, that's influenced by inflation. Um, you know, a lot of people also ask the question, well, how are crop prices, like the prices of corn, uh, wheat, and soybeans influenced by inflation? Um, and here, too, the answer is more complicated than you might imagine. Um, you know, a lot of people have sort of distant memories or perhaps no memory of the 1970s. Uh, probably think that higher inflation in the 70s was good for crop prices. Uh, the truth is it was more complicated. Uh, we had a big surge in inflation um, and from 1968 to 1970, and crop prices did not really go anywhere. Um, then we had a second huge surge in inflation in uh, 1973 and 1974. In that time, crop prices rocketed. Uh, corn prices went from 100 to 400 cents per bushel. So the price went up 300 uh, percent. But then we had a last even bigger surge in inflation at the end of the 70s until 1980. Um, and that time, corn prices you know, had fallen in the meantime to around 200. They rose back to 400, but they didn't really get to a new record high. Um, you know, then we had a long, long period of disinflation in the 1980s and 1990s. And during this time, for the most part, corn prices just went sideways in a, in a wide range. Uh, but farmers you know, really suffered during this period. Uh, but then, you know, much like gold, uh, corn prices soared uh, during the decade from 2000 to 2011, even though we did not really have much consumer price inflation overall. Uh, so what was happening at this time is that natural resource prices were rising, uh, but wages weren't rising. Um, the cost of employing people wasn't rising. Productivity was growing very quickly, so there was just not a lot of inflation. Um, now, this time around, uh, we have seen a surge in corn um, and other commodity prices um, as inflation has risen, uh, but that rise hasn't been uh, maybe as pronounced as you might imagine, uh, but a lot of it, I think, has also been driven by what's happened between Russia and Ukraine as well. Um, it's a very similar story if you look at soybeans, for example. Soybeans showed no reaction to the inflation in the late 1960s. Um, then they went at a tremendous rally. They went from 300 to 1,200 cents per bushel um, in 1973. It then later on in the 70s, when we had even higher inflation, um, eventually getting to 14% under the Carter administration um, at the end of the 70s. Soybean prices didn't do particularly well. Um, and soybean prices basically didn't really do anything again until around 2005 uh, when soybean prices soared uh, to then new record highs, um, despite the fact that inflation overall really wasn't that high. Uh, but this time around, ag prices have gone higher with inflation. So it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, sometimes corn and soybean prices respond to inflation and sometimes they don't. Um, and of course, it's the same story with wheat. You know, again, no response to the rise in inflation at the end of the 60s, but then a huge response um, in the early 70s. The early 70s rise, by the way, had a lot to do with buying from the Soviet Union, uh, which came into the American markets and bought tremendous amounts of corn, wheat, and soybeans during this time. Um, that had a big, big impact. Uh, it was referred to in the markets as the Great Soviet Grain Heist, um, but not a lot of reaction in wheat prices uh, to subsequent inflation in the later 70s. But then again, a huge rise in wheat prices from 2002 to 2008, even though inflation really wasn't all that bad. Uh, so this time, ag prices and inflation have both surged together, but it's not a guarantee that they'll continue to move together in the future. Um, in fact, if you take agricultural goods prices and you adjust them for inflation, um, this is the graph you see. Um, so this is the prices of corn, soybeans, and wheat uh, divided by the U.S. Consumer Price Index, uh, cumulative uh, index. And what you see, I think, is quite remarkable. Um, since 1965, crop prices in real terms have fallen in half. Um, so since 1965, we've had about 1,000% inflation, but food prices have only gone up maybe five times instead of 
you know, one, 10 times over, like we've seen with other non-food products. Um, and this, I think, is truly, truly remarkable because since 1965, the global population has more than doubled. Uh, we've gone from three and a half billion to nearly eight billion people. Um, at the same time, on average, people eat better. Um, you know, around the world, people eat 50% uh, more calories. You might even argue that in many countries like the United States and Europe, people eat too many calories. Um, but in any case, people are better fed now than they were 60 years ago. And crop prices have dropped in half in real terms. Uh, so this, I think, is truly remarkable. And it's a reflection of the fact that we've seen so much innovation in the farm sector. We've had a revolution of agricultural productivity. Um, now, what is interesting here, though, is in the last five or six years, that productivity seems to have hit a wall. Uh, we have not seen uh, per acre productivity for corn, wheat, and soybeans grow since 2016. Um, the reasons for that are not entirely known, uh, but there are some people who think this may have to do with climate change or global warming. Um, and as the climate's changing, it's harder for farmers uh, to continue to expand the amount of production that they get per acre or per hectare um, that they've harvested. Um, you know, talking about agricultural goods markets, I think it's a good transition into talking about other things that also influence ags. And so one of those big influences is what's happening in China. Um, and so during the COVID period, um, China has had a very, very different response to COVID than has the rest of the world. Um, in the United States, for example, and in the UK and throughout most of Western Europe, um, governments spent tremendous amounts of money to help people get through lockdowns. Uh, so governments use this as an excuse to provide a tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus. In the United States, the fiscal stimulus came to 25% of GDP. And I think that this is the thing that is primarily responsible for the rise in inflation in Europe and in North America. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people blame things like supply lines and yes, supply line problems and uh, supply chain problems um, certainly played some role in inflation. But I think they, that those supply chain problems occurred primarily as a result of government spending. You know, government in the United States in particular, sent trillions of dollars worth of checks to Americans all over the country, even people who did not need the help got aid. Um, and so as a result, American consumer spending rose tremendously, and it outstripped the ability of the U.S. economy to supply goods. Um, and this was really bullish, by the way, for industrial metals like copper and aluminum. Um, by contrast, China did not really spend much money on COVID aid, um, only 3% of GDP, which is weird because they spent a lot longer in lockdowns, uh, but they eventually just made their population suffer without any help from the government. Um, and so in some ways you may say that's cruel, but on the other hand, China also has much lower inflation. Uh, so China's inflation right now is around 2% uh, compared to 6% in the UK or 5% in Korea, 4% in Japan, 6% um, here in Europe. Um, but what's happening in the Chinese economy is I think the single biggest influence on commodity prices, um, especially uh, the prices of energy goods like uh, crude oil, like West Texas Intermediate or WTI crude, also a huge, huge impact on um, agricultural goods and on industrial metals. And so, but the way in which China impacts these markets is sometimes not well understood. Uh, I think everybody believes correctly that if China grows more quickly, commodity prices should go higher. And if China slows down, commodity prices should fall. And that's true, but there's one additional complication. And the additional complication is that when China's growth rate changes, the impact on commodity prices often doesn't happen for a long time, often about one year. Uh, so why is that? Well, a lot of countries store up commodities. I'll give you an example. Um, the United States, since the Arab oil embargo in 1973 and the Iranian revolution in 1978 and 79, um, concluded that having a lot of oil in storage was important for national security. 
So just in case our supplies got cut off. Um, so the United States established the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, where it essentially stocked hundreds of millions of barrels. It would be enough to supply the U.S. economy for months on end, and more importantly, to supply the U.S. military for a long period of time if it became necessary. Um, China does the same thing, uh, but they don't do it just with oil. They do it with pretty much all commodities. Um, so when you look at accelerations in Chinese growth, um, you can see that, for example, in the blue line, you have uh, our proxy for GDP called the Li Keqing Index. Um, it accelerated in 2005, 6, and 7. China was growing at a faster and faster pace. Oil prices rose and peaked in 2008. But by that time, China's economy was already slowing down very drastically. And they had a really big slowdown in late 2008 and early 2009. And then the price of oil subsequently crashed uh, from 140 to around $35 per barrel. Then China did a mega stimulus of its economy uh, where they got the economy growing uh, instead of 4% up to around 25% growth rates by 2010. Oil prices soared and they eventually peaked in 2011 and they remained high for many years. But in the meantime, in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, China's economy growth rate was declining. And then very abruptly at the end of 2014 and 2015, oil prices crashed and went from 100, um, eventually down to $23 per barrel. Uh, but then China stimulated its economy, things started growing faster and oil prices later recovered. Um, then China slowed again going into the pandemic and oil prices fell. Uh, then China because they reopened more quickly than most other countries did, thinking they had COVID under control, which turned out not to be true. Uh, but nevertheless, what they thought, China's economy started growing very quickly in late 2020 and early 2021. The so oil prices roared and they soared into the middle of 2022. But by that time, China's economy had slowed down very dramatically. And so now oil prices are starting to come back down. Um, and so, China stores up about a one-year supply of oil. Um, so you know, if China's economy starts to accelerate this year, which I think it will because they've lifted all of the COVID restrictions, and they've also eased their crackdown on property developers. If I'm right and China's economy starts growing this year, that may eventually be good for oil prices, but it doesn't mean it will be good in the short term uh, because China has a lot of oil in storage. They don't necessarily have to buy more immediately if their economy starts to improve. Um, the same thing is true for corn. Um, China stores up a tremendous amount of corn. I'd say probably a nine month to 12 month supply of corn, um, where it's just housed in, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, grain storage facilities in China. And the price of corn also tends to follow what's happening with Chinese growth, but with an even longer lag of often five or six quarters. So in other words, 15 or 18 months. Um, and the same thing happens for wheat. Wheat also follows what's happening in China, but again, with a lag of four to six quarters. So maybe 12 to 18 months later, China at the moment is storing up almost a one year supply of wheat. Um, so if their economy starts accelerating and oil prices rise, they don't necessarily have to buy more wheat immediately. Uh, finally, uh, soybean oil is also very closely connected to the Chinese economy. Uh, it seems like soybean oil often follows what's happening with China's growth rate, but about 12 months later. Um, so if you want a good indicator of where agricultural goods markets might be going, look at the Chinese economic data and especially look at the Li Keqing Index. The Li Keqing Index is a combination of three things, uh, electrical consumption, rail freight volumes, and the number of bank loans. So they're all hard things that are hard for the Chinese government to fake. Um, so they're actually you know, kind of real solid pieces of data about the health of China's industrial economy. Um, and meanwhile, China's uh, reopening from COVID is great news, but it's not the only thing that's happening in China. The other big thing happening in China is that they have tremendous amounts of debt. Um, so in a short term, reopening from COVID may create a surge in growth, we hope. But longer term, China's economy still has a lot of problems. And you know, we talked about China's mega surge in growth back in 2009 and in 2010. 
Um, that you know contributed to a huge rise in commodity prices, but that surge in growth was fueled by rising levels of debt. Um, they basically told their companies to borrow money and to invest in infrastructure products, projects. And that sent the price of oil, the price of copper and aluminum, et cetera, soaring. Um, since then, however, China's debt levels have gone from low levels to levels that now exceed those of the US and Western Europe. Um, so this, along with the fact that China's population is no longer growing, is a large part of the reason why we think that China's economic growth over the next decade will not be particularly strong. Um, China also has a very large property sector. Uh, the property sector or real estate sector in China uh, comes to nearly 30% of GDP, and we think that's too big. Um, Xi Jinping began to crack down on the property sector a couple of years ago. That's another part of the reason, in addition to the COVID lockdowns, why China's economy grew so slowly last year. Uh, Xi Jinping has been easing up on the property developers. Um, so you've seen this recovery, for example, in Chinese high yield bond prices, um, an indication that things in China are easing up a bit. But those markets are still very, very far down from their peaks. Um, and so if property markets continue not to do well, um, it's not clear that China's economy can support higher commodity prices. You know, lastly, there's the issue of China's currency. Um, China's currency um, generally over the last few years has been weakening versus the U.S. dollar. Uh, part of the reason for this is that while the U.S. central bank is raising interest rates, China's central bank has been cutting interest rates. Um, and so as a result, the renminbi has been weakening or the yuan has been weakening. Um, so all of these things, I think, are things to look at. Um, just a few other items here. Uh, when it takes, you know, one other important thing anybody in our commodity markets needs to consider is the shape of the forward curve. Um, the forward curve um, tells you where investors think prices will be in the future, uh, most likely be in the future. Um, so, for example, if you think soybean prices and corn prices are going down, uh, you can't necessarily make money in those markets by taking a short position because the term structure of those markets already reflects an expectation of lower prices for corn and soybeans. The wheat market here is different. Wheat is still very disturbed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, and, and traders think there's going to be a lot of tension in the wheat market over the next few years. Um, likewise, corn or soybean oil and soybean meal prices are also in what we call backwardation. So the short-term prices are higher than prices further out on the curve because traders expect those prices to fall. Um, another thing to consider, agricultural goods prices are very tightly connected with energy prices. Um, you may have wondered why ags prices react to what happens in China. A lot of it has to do with the fact that ags and oil prices are tightly connected for two reasons. First, agriculture is energy intensive. It takes a lot of energy to farm. Secondly, um, biofuels, uh, corn um, and, and soybean oil in particular, are often used as additives to, to fuels and to refine products. Um, so when you look at the oil market, the oil market is also in backwardation. Uh, traders in that market think that most likely West Texas intermediate crude oil prices will fall from around 80 to around $70 per barrel over the next decade, or over the next, I should say, three, two years or so. Um, part of this is because we've seen a tremendous rise in oil inventories. You know, the oil market is very well supplied at the moment. Uh, we have a lot of oil in inventory. It's higher now um, at the end of February than it was um, at similar times of the year um, in 20. Uh, 2020, 2019, 2021, or 2022. Um, it's a little bit of a different story for products like gasoline and ultra-low sulfur diesel, formerly known as heating oil. Their inventories are not as high, um, but we have seen um, a recovery in U.S. production. Um, OPEC has been trying to keep a lid on prices, but they haven't really been so successful. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to pass the baton over to my colleague, David um, who can uh, share some additional ideas on how you can execute uh, trades in the commodity markets from a technical perspective uh, based upon your own insights into those markets. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to, uh, like yourself, share a screen presentation deck. Bear with me just a minute.
let me know if you can see that. Hmm. Is my uh, my deck up on the on the screen? Yes, it looks good. Okay, then let's begin. Thank you, Eric, for that wonderful uh, introduction uh, on on the commodity markets relative to inflation, and and what a great time to be having this conversation with what's been going on in in the world capital markets in the last just just several last couple of days, it reintroduces the concepts of pricing volatility. And that's going to be a subject that's going to be at the heart of what I'm about to present. So like my colleague, I'm going to be begin by saying <clears throat> today's session is meant to be educational and informative and is in no way meant to be construed as offering investment advice nor making trading recommendations. You're going to see examples of some trading strategies uh, in the next couple of minutes, but they should not be taken as investment advice nor as recommendations on trades, but are merely being used to demonstrate uh, for educational purposes. Uh, <clears throat> the futures markets, of which CME Group is a large uh, part of, have as their historical uh, tool standardized futures contracts. And futures contracts have been marvelous for commercial and institutional hedging for many, many generations in that they allow commercial and institutional users of our markets that already have the business risk of being in the physical commodities to use the futures contracts as a hedging or a risk management tool. Um, and what makes these contracts useful to them is that they have a, you know, a, a, a linear reaction to the underlying prices. In other words, if you're long a futures uh, position to either replicate risk or to lay off uh, the, the, the impact of, of higher prices, and those prices do go up, the futures contracts go up with them in a linear relationship. If you're using the futures markets from the short side or selling futures contracts uh, in anticipation of lower rates or as a hedge against lower pr commodity prices, they're also hugely beneficial. But the relationship is rather linear in terms of reactions to prices. <clears throat> what I'm gonna suggest we look at today are options as a strategic trading tool or a uh, risk management tool. And one of their benefits, and when you, if, 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 if uh, you're familiar with options, you know that there are two types of options, calls representing uh, risk to an underlying long position and puts representing risk to an, a short position. Long options positions, in this case, a long call, uh, like a futures contract, benefit in a, in a theoretically unlimited uh, reaction to higher prices. In other words, if I'm long a call and the price of my underlying product goes up, I'm going to have uh, be able to participate favorably in that upward price movement. But if I'm long that call and the markets go down, unlike a futures position that has unlimited exposure to the price action, a long call position has limited price exposure in the negative price action. So if we consider a long put position, it benefits theoretically to uh, unlimited means to a market price lower action in the marketplace, where if the underlying commodity were to go up in price, its loss is limited to the premium paid on a long put position. This relationship in terms of options, long options positions, is said to be asymmetrical in that there are uh, asymmetrical risk reward relationships to these long options positions. This can make them, in many cases, wonderful trading and risk management tools. Another aspect of options as opposed to futures is part of their price input or the, the inputs that go into the premium of the options themselves <clears throat> is attributable to market volatility 
which means that as market volatility goes up, the premiums tends to expand in options. As market volatility goes down, the premiums tend to contract uh, both puts and calls. But this means that in many cases, they can be used to either trade or hedge market volatility risk. Now, I want to remind everybody uh, that options premiums are driven by theoretical pricing models. And because these uh, are, are different, depending on the system that you use or the options theory that you follow, uh, we can't always assume that we're going to get the proper results that we want. So use options pricing and options tools at your own risk. Just a couple of reviews on options. Options can, because of this asymmetrical risk reward relationship, can be used both for hedging and for trading strategies. Uh, they may be used in conjunction or as a complement to an underlying futures position as we're gonna consider in the next few minutes, but they also could be used against spot or physical risk positions as well. Now, when we talk about options, at CME Group, we're always referring to options on futures positions. So if you want, rather than the underlying product. So if you think about options at CME Group, you want to be thinking of them as a second derivative. The first derivative being the futures contract that derives its value from an underlying physical or an index uh, market. The options at CME will always have as their underlying a futures position, which means that they're deriving their prices from the derived first derivative, which is the futures contract. <clears throat> now, not all of the options expirations at CME line up necessarily with their underlying futures market expirations as well. So there's a certain amount of education that has to be done to get familiar with options at CME which options uh, those or which futures contracts those options price to and what their uh, expiration calendars are like relative to the futures contracts. Now, when you purchase options, you pay the full premium amount. That is generally all that would be required to keep that position open because that's the maximum that that position can uh, lose. <clears throat> but in the event that you're either in spreads where you might result in a credit position or just short an options position. Since there is theoretically unlimited risk to that position, there could be initial margining over and above the premium that's received uh, required from CME clearing. And for this, you'll need to consult with your FCM or, or futures broker. So options premiums are affected by lots of independent market forces. The movement of the underlying futures contract, uh, the volatility, of that price action, as well as the amount of time left in the option itself. Options contracts have expiration dates, just like futures contracts, and that expiration date has an impact on the pricing of the premium. Understanding those different input variables, and we sometimes refer to them as the Greeks, delta and gamma reflecting market price action in the underlying's impact on premium, Vega representing uh, the impact of market volatility on the premium, and Theta representing uh, the premium sensitivity to changes in time decay, all go into uh, the option premium pricing dynamics. And if you need a, a little bit more education on options theory, we have some uh, curriculum and, and uh, educational modules at CME Institute are teaching a portal on our website that can provide you some wonderful uh, examples of education in this area that are free for your use. Uh, we're going to consider in some working examples long and short or spread positions in options. And so it is the net uh, deltas and net gammas that we're going to be considered. A net positive delta position is traditionally viewed as being a price bullish or have an upward bullish bias. A negative net delta position would be viewed as a price bearish or downward bias to price. A net long vega infers uh, 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 that the position would benefit from higher volatility bias and a short vega or a negative vega position, uh, a lower volatility bias. <clears throat> and then long or positive theta represents the benefits of time decay, uh, whereas a negative theta uh, position, net theta position will reflect a, a cost of time decay uh, being negative to the position. 
Eric gave us a very good introduction on core, uh, excuse me, on gold as, as a commodity market. And I'm going to be using gold as a working example of how options on gold at CME might be used as a trading vehicle or a risk management tool. And what you're looking at in this slide is a screenshot from a wonderful tool at cmegroup.com called QuickStrike. And QuickStrike takes into account uh, the pricing of options at CME Group. And what you're seeing is a picture of the gold market from the 2nd of March, just a couple of weeks ago. And the, uh, the blue line with the circles, which is in some areas in this chart, somewhat obscured by the purple line, uh, because the, the price action from the first week of March and the uh, third week or the last week of February were very, very highly correlated. But you can see, uh, if you look at the green line at the top, where prices were at the end of January, gold fell <clears throat> uh, rather nicely uh, in the month of February and into the first week of March. It has subsequently, in the last several days, rallied back pretty much or very, very, very closely to that green line as prices existed at the end of January. And you can see, if you look at the x-axis at the bottom, the uh, location of the various forward expiration dates of gold futures contracts at CME. So you're looking at a market that is said to be in contango, where the price action of the deferred months are higher than uh, the prices in the nearby months. Uh, the slope in, of, of that relationship is very dynamic. It's different depending on a commodity. It could be different depending on the seasonality of that commodity or also what's going on in that uh, physical marketplace as it relates to expectations as expressed in the futures market. But what we want to consider is that there's lots of gold contracts that have open interest and trading activity and the choice and the selection of that particular expiration month is at the discretion of the market user depending on what the risk is that they want to trade or hedge. We list options on the various futures contracts that relate to the same expiration calendar here. Another consideration when we look at options is what's known as the volatility skew. If you look at the relative volatilities of strikes relative to a particular expiration cycle, you're going to get, depending on the commodity or uh, the market conditions, something that may look like what you're looking at here. This is the volatility skew of gold, uh, again, on that, that first week of March, where the at the monies are roughly 1850. Uh, and you can see that that's where the lowest levels of volatility are. If you go out in strikes away from the money, either into the money or out the money, you're seeing increases in the implied volatility of the strikes at those distant, um, further away from the at the money strikes. This creates what's known as a, a volatility smile, and it's reflected in the shape of the skew chart. Uh, in Depending on market conditions, you can see a smile that's very clearly defined here uh, with the volatilities going up as you move away from at the money. Some commodities don't necessarily have a smile. They might be somewhat skewed, like in, in equity index futures, it's said to be more of a smirk because the, uh, the elevation in volatilities appears more dramatically in the out of the money puts than it does or, or lower strikes than it does in higher strike uh, out of the money, higher uh, price strikes. So different commodities have different volatility skews, different times of the year can affect volatility skews. But what's important is we look at gold at least in the next few uh, couple of examples, is, is as you move away from at the money, volatility tends to rise. And that can provide some benefits uh, to risk managers and traders in terms of the application of various option related strategies. <clears throat> I've created a table from Quick Strike data, uh, in this case, uh, again, that, that first week of March on gold when the underlying June gold futures was approximately 1839 even in terms of its price. We're considering June expirations of options as well. And what we're looking at are 
the if you look at the center of the table, the 1840 strike would be considered the at the money strike. And you can see if you move to the left columns, you're looking at call information and to the right put information. And because of put call parity, the gammas, the vegas, and the thetas are the same for both puts and calls, the various strikes. And at the far left, you can see the respective volatilities. So if we look at kind of a reminder of that skew chart, if you look at the volatility on the 1840s, it's the lowest. And as you move both in terms of higher strikes going down, the volatility goes up. And if you go to lower strikes and go higher, uh, the volatility uh, also goes higher. So uh, it just reinforces that idea that as you move in either direction, from the at the monies, the volatility will tend to be higher in, in its valuation, which impacts the price or the premium of the options at those various strike prices. Um, we don't have the time to go into a deeper dive on options theory here, but if you're looking for more information, I would again refer you to CME Institute's curriculum on the options. Now we wanna consider a couple of ways in which if we assume that an individual trader or a risk manager is already long gold. And that gold could be in a physical position, but in my examples, I'm going to use a long futures position. Uh, what would one might do to hedge or reduce the risk of an adverse price move lower in gold? So if we assume we're already long the gold futures market, our concern is to lower prices. There are several option strategies that might be applied uh, as opposed to liquidating the futures position, which would of course eliminate the risk completely. If I wanted to remain long my futures position in gold, but wanted some protection, what might I do in terms of option strategies to provide that protection? Well, the oldest and probably the simplest option strategy is what's known as a buy right. I'm already long the gold, so I've already bought it, and I'm going to short or right is another way of expressing a selling or a short position in an options position. I'm going to write an, an out of the money call to protect myself. If we assume that the gold futures for June delivery are at 1839 even, and the at the money volatility is at 1335%, I wanna be able to protect myself from a small downward price movement, but maintain exposure to an upside price movement. In other words, continue to participate profitably if gold goes up, but also get some downside price protection if the market were to sell off. How do I do that? Well, if we look at the delta of an 18, a 1930 call, which is higher in its strike price than the at the money, you'll notice it's got a higher price that in, 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 and it has delta at that higher price is roughly 23. I want to construct what's considered to be a delta neutral or a lower uh, delta position in my outright long position. By selling one 1930 call that has a delta of 23, since I'm selling it, it applies in my formula as a negative number, which means it subtracts from my delta of 100 because my futures position will always have a delta of one. <clears throat> So if I'm long one June contract, I have a theoretical long delta of 100. By selling this out of the money call, I'm reducing my net delta to 77, 23 minus 100. Uh, that results in a credit because I'm selling the option, I receive the premium on that option. And in this case, it's worth $15.40. And each one of those is worth 100 100 equivalent troy ounces of gold, I would receive roughly $1,500 as, 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 uh, as a premium. Now that has to stay at the clearinghouse to protect the open position, but it gives me some downside price protection. In other words, if gold were to sell off, I would be protected to the level at which that $1,540 $1 credit is worth. In other words, down to 1823.60 as a June futures price. So if gold goes down from 1839 to roughly 1823.60, I'm still going to maintain a, a, 
a, a positive PNL to the extent that I've received that, that premium on that option. Now, we can look at this graphically, and this is another wonderful benefit of the Quick Strike tool. It's available on cmegroup.com. You can see that uh, I've got somewhat of a limited price protection down to that level of 1823.60. Beyond that, I'm afraid I'm still exposed to unlimited price lists. But if the market were to rally, I don't begin to flatten out until we get above uh, 1945 and 40 cents. So I will participate, continue to participate in a upward trading gold market. I will have a limited price downward protection to the extent of the premium that I've received in this buy right strategy. But beyond that, still exposed to maximum loss. So this is a simple example of a limited downside price protection provided by doing what's known as a buy right or selling a call against an open long futures position. What if we want additional protection and perhaps uh, participate by being long some volatility? Well, you could certainly just go out and buy an out of the money put, uh, but that exposes you to an enormous amount of time decay risk. Another strategy using both long and short puts is called a vertical put spread. And that's what we're gonna consider next. Again, let's assume we're long one June gold position at 1839. That long position has a delta of 100 per contract. We're going to consider what's known as a long put spread. And that involves buying a near to the money put and selling a further out of the money or down lower price strike, strike price put in a one-to-one -one ratio. And what that gives us is the long put protection of the nearer to the out of the money put, the 1810 in this case, which has a delta of 39. And since it's a put and we're buying it, 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 it provides a negative input in our formula. And then the further out of the money put, in this case, the 1750 puts, would also have a negative delta as a put, but because we're selling it, it, it's applied as a positive number. So the combination of the two results in a net delta of less than 100. So we're less long by putting on this vertical put spread, but still long, which means if prices go higher, we're going to continue to participate in that upward profit activity if prices in gold go above 1839. But if prices go down, we'll also have some price protection. It's The position is pretty much neutral to gamma, which means uh, the speed at which the price moves is not very important to us. The long net vega means that if volatility increases, it should favorably improve the, the, the price action of the spread. But th the negative theta tells us that time decay is going to be eating away at our uh, adverse price protection. So how does this look graphically? Well, if prices trade higher, we're gonna continue to participate because it's a long put vertical. Uh, it, it's going to give us some downside price protection, but only to a certain degree. And you can see that once you get down to the 1750 strike price, the lower of the two, uh, it begins to uh, lose its value. And we will continue to have theoretically unlimited downside risk to our long futures position. But we're going to participate in both the, uh, the upward price action uh, should the market trade higher, once we've covered uh, the cost of the spread, and we've got some limited price protection to the downside, but only to the degree of the lower strike price uh, minus what we've uh, paid for the spread. So this, again, it provides some risk loss price protection to downside moves while allowing us to participate in upside moves, but to a limited degree. The last strategy we want to consider is known as a collar, and it's called a collar because it wraps around both puts and calls. So we'll, again, we're going to start with that long June gold position at 1839 and a delta of 100, 
And a collar involves the purchase of a put for that extreme adverse downside price protection. And you can see it's at about 100 points below uh, the marketplace here as a 1750 put. And we're going to help finance that insurance policy or that long put position by selling an out of the money call. And this is way out of the money at 1930, uh, 100 points above the market. So you're receiving premium by selling the call, paying premium by buying the put. And because of the pricing of, of these two strike prices, we end up with a, a much, much lower net delta of 50, but yet it's still positive. So if the market trades sharply higher, we're going to continue to benefit from higher prices. But we will also have some downside price protection in the event that the market sells off. The gammas, the vegas, and the thetas are all relatively neutral. Uh, not much activity there. So if we look at this graphically, you can see we've got some downward price protection especially if the market goes off the rails and sells off below the out of the money put level to where that becomes in the money again at 1750 or lower you're neutral to price activity if but if the market goes above your call price of 1950 you're also going to be not participating in any more of the upside move because of the short call position. But between those two strikes, you're getting some adverse price protection to the downside if prices sell off, and you're still participating, but to a lesser degree, to a, a, a positive price action should markets trade higher. So what you've seen are three examples of how options could be used to protect a long position in a commodity. And in this case, it does it, it, the same examples that, that I've been using for gold could be applied to copper or any other metal, but they could also be applied to any other options prod or any other commodity contract as well. Uh, and adverse price movements are not just to the downside. Uh, we could also apply strategies using options if the adverse price move was to say so something sharply higher. The difference would be we, it, instead of using puts, we would be using calls in our, is our, is our working example in those things. And we could just as easily do that for upward price movement if the higher prices is the adverse price move to the risk manager or the trader's position. Uh, all of these options contracts are actively traded in our leading benchmark products. They're a very large and fast growing part of CME's trading volume, and not just at CME, but in every futures exchange around the world that lists options. Options are a fast growing product because of their usefulness, as you've seen, in both risk management functions, but also in trading applications. Uh, I'm gonna pause there and open up the forum for questions for either Eric or myself. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can both, uh, both participate here. Eric, feel free to jump in here if you see something in the chat box that's worthy of response. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna take a quick, uh, quick, um... Yeah, a quick read through what we have here and see what we've got and see if there's anything that we can uh, answer and help with. Um, all right. That one question looks a little long for us to be able to answer at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, but I don't have a lot of expertise on what's going on in the Egyptian market. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, this is a, essentially what's happening in, in Egypt is in some ways, um, you know, in some ways not that dissimilar to what's happening in other countries. I mean, like I have my money. I mean, a lot of it's a lot of my own personal money is invested in like stocks or bonds or gold or whatever. But, you know, some of it does sit in bank accounts. I mean, not a lot of it, but. You know, in, in the U.S. or the U.K., if you had money sitting in a bank account, it lost, you know, 10 percent of its value over the course of the last few years, uh, maybe more, maybe more like 12 or 15 percent when you compounded out for two years. Um, 
you know, so it's just been a really tough position to have any sort of, you know, money sitting in bank deposits. Um, over and the is, last Eric, is that, is, is, that, is that because of the way inflation eats into the value of the currency itself? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, essentially inflation, you could view it as a, it's two ways. You could view it as a rate, of, rate at which prices rise, seen from the perspective of a currency, or you could view it as the rate at which a currency loses value versus inflation. Or versus versus you know real real goods that you would you would need to buy. Um, so you know, if you have 10% inflation, that means that you've lost your money has lost 9% of its value uh, versus goods. You know, if you have 25% inflation, that means you've lost 20% of your uh, of your currency's value. Um, and like I know that Egypt, like many other countries, has suffered from high rates of inflation. Um, and, you know, in, in many cases, like even in the U.S. where the Fed has rates up at, you know, four and a half percent, I think banks are only paying maybe two percent interest now. Uh, so if we have six percent inflation this year and interest is two percent, you're still at negative four percent. Um, so I think that's why a lot of investors you know, are still interested in things like gold and silver, because they hold their value, unlike fiat currencies. Do we have any other questions coming through? I think there may have been another question that popped can up here you, in the can chat. Can you open the, the Q&A box, yeah. Eric? Yeah, well, I have it open on my screen, yeah. Do you want me to read it? Um, well, there's um, one about the UK and Europe, Brexit, yeah. that, that, that yeah. I, you might be able yeah, to Yeah, that, that one just popped up a second. It says, in the event of UK and Europe Brexit, how EU market decisions impacted the UK market. How directly or indirectly is the market correlated? Okay, yeah, so in the context of fixed income, the UK and European markets trade very closely with respect to one another. Um, they're not exactly the same uh, because the Bank of England has complete control over, or more or less complete control over short-term interest rates in the UK. Um, whereas the U European Central Bank has more or less complete control over short-term interest rates in Europe. Um, but when you go further up the yield curve, when you start looking at, say, 10-year bonds, uh, which is what the gilt future is based on, or 10-year um, you know, bonds in Europe, which is what futures on, say, the OAT in France, or the uh, German Bund, or the Italian Bono are based on, um, those do tend to move together. Uh, but Europe has a sort of, the Eurozone has a sort of special quality to it that's very unlike the UK or the US. Um, and what makes it different is that um, you essentially have a bunch of countries emitting debt into a common currency that none of them control. Um, so it's sort of like more like a municipal bond market. Um, and this is why you see the spreads changing between European bonds. Um, you know, so one of the big risks, I think, is that with tighter monetary policy, um, Italian bonds, Greek bonds, maybe even French bonds could wind up selling off versus Germany. Um, and that would not necessarily have any direct impact at all on the United Kingdom. Um, the UK, um, like the US, has one sovereign issuer, um, the UK Treasury or the US Treasury, issuing into one currency that's controlled by a central bank that is also essentially reporting to that government. Um, so in the case of the UK, it's the Bank of England. In the case of the US, it's the Federal Reserve. Uh, but that's not, however, true in Europe, where you have um, many different countries issuing debt into a currency that's created by the European Central Bank. And no one country has complete control of the ECB. Um, so, you know, I think that there, are, there is a lot of influence. So when you look at long-term rates around the world, they're also very influenced by what's happening in the US Treasury market. Um, the U.S. Treasury market is sort of the dominant actor among interest rates, and so the gilt market as well as the bund market in the eurozone tend to follow, uh, to some extent, what's happening in the Treasury market, uh, because it reflects um, essentially the yields on U.S. Treasuries versus other bonds reflect a global competition to raise capital in these markets. Um, and so the, there can be changes in the spreads versus these bonds, but they often do move in tandem. We have any other questions? I don't see anything else coming through yet, but we, oh, no, that's a few other things that popped up. Um, would you advise me on something to get out of this crisis? Well, yeah, this, I guess, responds to the Egypt question. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I can't really give you any financial advice, and I don't really have a lot of expertise in what's happening in Egypt. 
So unfortunately, I'm not really in a position to offer you advice. I'm sorry. Do we have any other questions coming through? I don't see any other questions. Uh, no, nothing at this point. No. Well, yeah, for my part, then I will uh, we wish everyone the very best of success. Thank you for your time and your interest in CME. And uh, I would like to just give a quick plug to the educational portal, CME Institute, which is available at cmegroup.com under the education tab at the top of the uh, of the website. By all means, make uh, avail yourself to the uh, wonderful uh, resources that are available. There's there's core curriculum. There are uh, webinars, archived webinars, as well as content from third party providers on all of our markets, all of our products, some of which uh, Eric has provided uh, and some have come from others as well. Um, it's a great resource that you can explore at your own time and at your own pace uh, to make yourselves a little more educated about our markets and our products. Uh, thank you for your time today. And then I'll leave the rest of it uh, for you, Eric. All right, well, thank you all very much. I hope you found it helpful, and uh, I think we're going to come back with at least one more uh, webinar, I think, in April, if that's correct. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So thank you all so much, and have a good rest of your day. Cheers. Bye.